OK, our next news story then, PlayStation 5 Pro. Uh, we believe it's coming this year. We've seen some disclosures so far derived from um, documentation that came from Sony's developer portal and some more mor morsels. Uh, emerged that came to our attention this week and I'm just taking a look at it now and um, yeah um, there have been a few things sort of question marks over over PlayStation 5 Pro and particularly its GPU and hopefully we could address some of them here now first of all um, we know from the disclosures so far that the GPU has 30 work groups um, and uh, that kind of suggests that we're going to get um, 60 compute units right but there has been some people suggesting that it would have 56 compute units because it would have um, a greater degree of compatibility with the existing design for back compat purposes. And secondly, a reduced amount of compute units to reach the sort of advertised 33 teraflops, then um, it would actually mean a higher boost clock than, than what we think it is, which what we think it is is 2.18 gigahertz based on 60 compute units. Um, so yeah, documentation has now emerged, which kind of clears up some of it. And the 30 work groups is confirmed, the WGPs rather, um, it is confirmed. Um, it's across two SEs and four SAs in an 8787 configuration. Um, and they actually have a direct comparison here with PlayStation 5, the standard PlayStation 5, as they call it, 18 WGP in two SEs, four SAs in a 5454 configuration. So, um, yes, I mean, at the base level, if Sony itself is confirming 18 WGP for PS5, that means 36 compute units, which in turn means 30 in 5 Pro, which means 60 compute units. So that's that sorted out. Um, there's also some new disclosures in terms of uh, the caches. The GL2 cache remains the same. Uh, GL1 doubles in size, 256K versus 128 on the standard PS5. Uh, and this is needed to support the fact that it's simply a much bigger GPU. Uh, interesting one here, the GL0V cache doubles in size to 32K from 16K. Sony specifically says this is to allow for higher rate facing performance. Now, something else which is quite interesting, which is the whole concept of the clock rate of the uh, GPU. Now, it's been kind of reversed engineered that we've got um, about 2.18 gigahertz boost clock from the fact that we have 33 teraflops. However, according to uh, this documentation, the max variable frequency on the PlayStation 5 Pro GPU isn't 2.18 gigahertz. It's actually 2.35 gigahertz up from the 2.23 in uh, the standard PlayStation 5, um, which is incompatible with the 33 teraflop number. It should be more in line with like 36 teraflops. Um, however, it's also said here that the 2.35 is the absolute max that the processor will go to, that the GPU will go to, and it's usually power limited. Um, so I guess that's why we've got that um, lower teraflop than expected figure. And I guess the 2.18 gigahertz is maybe more in line with general operation. Mm -hmm. um, Oliver, any thoughts before we go on to other stuff that has <laughs> been unearthed? Yeah, I mean, it does suggest, their wording here does suggest the console is significantly power limited, just because they are expressing that 2.35 gigahertz number as a max number. Whereas with PS5, they were very eager, I think, to say, hey, our uh, stated maximum clock rates, we're going to be there or thereabouts. Like, we're going to be pretty close in most titles. And certainly, I think what we've seen since then has indicated, like, yeah, those are maximum numbers, but you're getting, you know, pretty close to those numbers in, in actual fact. So I think in this case, you're probably looking at a console that is, like, pretty power limited, maybe a little bit thermally limited, and just can't push to a super high frequency. But at the same time, you know, it it is a it is a higher frequency, and I guess theoretically it should be a 36 teraflop console in the FP32. I think with this uh, clock bump in mind or thereabouts, but I presume they're just quoting typical numbers in that case because yeah, otherwise it would be higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything to add, Alex? Uh, no, I just pretty much exactly what Oliver said, and I think yeah, I'm very curious to see what this uh, power and perhaps thermally limited console looks like in the box because. Even the slimmed down PS5 is still really big, so 
I'm very curious to see what the box design is. Yeah, something else which came to uh, light is that um, if you're looking for like leaked photos of a PS5 Pro dev kit, well, you've already seen it. It looks identical to the PlayStation 5 standard dev kit, mm -hmm. you know, that big V-shaped monster. The PS5 Pro dev kit looks exactly the same. It has the same casing. So yeah, <laughs> now you know. Um, yeah, and it also says in, um, in the disclosures that um, the GPU is usually power limited. And those higher frequencies, the 2.35 gigahertz, it is attainable, but only on very, uh, they call it a limited subset of games. So yeah, that's, that's kind of indicating that it's sort of only going to be reaching that in extraordinary circumstances. That's quite interesting. But what also comes to light is the fact that, well, um, Perhaps unfairly, the original PlayStation 5 GPU was called like RDNA 1.5. Uh, to be fair, it did seem to have a mixture of uh, features from RDNA 1 and 2. But it does look as though, just as a matter of course, the PlayStation 5 Pro GPU is getting more features. Um, Alex, you've seen this. What yeah. do you think of it? So um, the thing that the documentation points out and that we talked about one last thing, uh, I think it was like three weeks ago now, was that um, the PlayStation 5 Pro is going to support hardware VRS. And we've talked about VRS a lot on the channel and its usage in games has been, I don't know, it's like both good and bad at the same time where it's a, on PC games, it's been an option that you can select in a variety of titles. And I've either advised for it or against it, like in Starfield that we were just talking about. I think I said like on PC you can use it, but it was like purposely set up to be only maybe perhaps like a little bit of help for a couple of GPUs out there. And it wasn't set up in such a way to be visually noticeable. And that's what I think the largest issue with VRS has been in titles beyond another issue I'm going to talk about in a second, but setting up variable rate shading, which is essentially uh, usually games will degrade the entire quality of the entire uh, visual output of a game via resolution um, to scale frame rate. So console games will use dynamic resolution. Uh, variable rate shading essentially allows you to control the quality, the coarseness of a shading of little tiles of the screen and have a greater control essentially of like when you want to have more performance you can degrade only smaller portions of the screen instead of the entire image. Now, that's a balancing act about how user noticeable it is. And due to like, essentially, you can, it's pretty easy to notice at times. And also due to the fact that a lot of games now use dynamic resolution coupled with things like FSR2, um, it's maybe, you know, VRS, its usage hasn't been so great. Another aspect of VRS is usage not being so high as it potentially could have been is the fact that the PlayStation 5 doesn't support it and a lot of and like literally the PlayStation 5 is the de facto like AAA multi-platform target like if you're looking at it like there's a lot of stuff that just goes in to make that PS5 version great and if it you need to spend more time like looking at something that only supports a certain subset of you know like Xbox and PC from RDNA 2 up or Turing up or Intel Arc up, well, then you're going to say, maybe we don't need this if it's not going to give us great visual or performance wins. And it's just like a nice plus. So I think that's limited VRS to a certain degree. Uh, here, now that PlayStation 5 Pro supports it, I actually do think we could see more VRS implementations in games because, well, if you're going to offer support for it and there's slightly, you know, like, it's the PlayStation 5 Pro GPU isn't so much like so radically large in comparison to the base PS5 one. This will be another thing that they can add on top of it uh, to, you know, extract more performance and get greater differences in visuals and quality between it and the PlayStation 5. So it's like I could imagine uh, this being added into a number of titles actually as a result of that. And then maybe being supported on other platforms. Sometimes we've seen VRS added to games, uh, on, like on console, but not added on PC. I think Doom Eternal is a really great example of that, where they ship it on console, but they don't ship it on PC yeah. for Xbox. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, but uh, there's a couple other things in here that I want to talk about. Um, the, the sheet mentions 
changing like the pixel center position for VRS is an, a, an addition to something that uh, is not natively supported via the API on DX12's VRS tier two. And that's like kind of true and kind of not true at the same time. Uh, because Intel has talked about it a lot in the past, actually, that you can just kind of like jitter the entire screen and make it so that TAA amortizes the uh, degraded shading over multiple frames from VRS. And that'll make it so that a problem with VRS, and John pointed out this, I think in his original like Doom Eternal video, even though I think that's like one of the better implementations, is that when you do notice this degradation from VRS, it looks almost like an integer scaled subset of pixels. So it kind of looks like, it looks like unfiltered textures from a really old game. And I think it can be distracting. There's been issues also in games like, was it Cyberpunk 2077? Dead Space was bad. Dead Space, was, Dead Space is a really good example of <laughs> VRS not showing up well, particularly bad on PS5, but I would also say not great on Xbox Series X. And I found it like dubious on PC. Um, so like the, the, the shit, this is more of a software thing and developers could always do this, but them supporting it in the API, like discreetly it is saying like, you know, you can have VRS in a game and you can have it be practically invisible due to TAA. Unfortunately, a lot of game developers haven't done this. And I think actually this is really good, uh, in general, because I think VRS, if they have this and you have PSS, are on top of this, uh, you can get a really great image without any of the VRS downgrades. And I think we're going to start seeing this in other games too on PC, for example. Uh, UE5 just added software VRS, and I'm pretty sure it takes into account like this pixel center position thing so that you don't see it so easily uh, when you're using TSR. And also Intel has research about combining their VRS with XESS and doing similar things. Uh, so that's all great. Uh, I guess another thing I guess kind of, kind of mention is that, uh, they also mention being able to use it to have like a variable MSAA rate for a game. And this is technically something that exists since a long, long time, but it's not like explicitly exposed. Uh, and them supporting it directly in the API could lead to some novel use cases of games that support MSAA and using it for certain things. Like I could imagine it being used for like transparencies or in VR games potentially. So you could have like a PlayStation 5 Pro VR game having unique image quality characteristics, uh, even, gr you know, even better than what you see on PlayStation 5. Mm. Uh, yeah, I guess that's really all I have to say about VRS. Do we want to move on to the, the next <laughs> bit? <laughs> yeah, let's move on to the next bit. I'm going to go to you again on the Alex because okay. uh, it is this kind of um, it's kind of like a hangover from PlayStation Five that it didn't have the full Direct DirectX 12 feature set. Obviously, mesh shaders was a part of that. It did have primitive shaders, which was kind of like a sort of precursor, I guess, to mm -hmm. mesh shaders. Um, RDNA one, we we think that's where that particular thing comes from but it does look as though ps5 pro does have full mesh shader support now yeah and this is for me like so the actual like differences and what this means is purely programmatic but there is a hardware difference to allow it to be done and this is the reason why for example the way amd actually supports mesh shaders on pc according to an amd driver engineer i'm pretty sure is actually it runs primitive shaders on pc that are uh, like essentially uh, software, like from the driver perspective, it's changing it into primitive shaders and it is not following the exact same uh, mesh shading model that p potentially Intel or NVIDIA are doing, but it at least spits out the exact same thing at the end. Um, and that's the important part. And that was possible with changes done to the hardware in RDNA 2, but RDNA 1 didn't have that. Um, so that allowed things like the amplification stage being done. I think actually it's still done with a compute shader, like just a normal compute shader in RDNA 2, but that's all done in the, at, at the driver level. And this is great, I think, because right now we're getting to uh, the mid-gen time and we are only now seeing the first implementations of mesh shading. It's like two titles. I mean... You well, got, Simon Wake, what's the other one? 
Uh, technically on console. Final uh, Fantasy Seven Rebirth does uh, primitive shaders. Oh, that's another one I didn't think about. Yeah, <laughs> but that one is. <laughs> I don't know. That's like a more <laughs> dubious visual example of it. I <laughs> I don't know. Like when I think about that game, I don't think of like super hardcore like geometric complexity on like oh, smaller okay. objects. So it's a little bit awkward. Um, also, technically. Avatar on console uses primitive shaders and also on Xbox mesh shading. Uh, on PC, they don't. And uh, I think like now we're going to start to see what people can really do with them. And we're going to only start seeing like things like Frostbite titles. Um, they mentioned in those, what is it called? Rex engine now? Resident Evil's Reach for the Moon engine, the, the addition to it. engine? The RE oh. engine, yeah, like they have like a slightly different name for the RE engine right now ever since they upgraded it. I forget the name of it, but uh, they mentioned they're doing mesh shading uh, for future titles, like they're doing the research on it now. And I think that's where we're going to start seeing larger differences between the visuals of previous gen games and current gen games. And Alan Wake 2, I think, was a great example of that. Like, if you look at it, the only thing that I think that separates it from like the visual quality of Nanite is the fact that it still has discrete level of detail quality. So you can see things um, like snapping. But like when you go right up to like any of like the control panels or the little cups or anything in Alan Wake 2, it's like super high quality. Uh, and I think that's stuff we're going to just see for the future games. And I, I'm excited for PS5 Pro supporting it because hopefully it means then there's a greater base to support it elsewhere too, Xbox, PC included. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, any final thoughts, Oliver? No, I think it's it's interesting. It kind of sketches out a future where the PS5 at least has the RDNA 2 feature set in, in this regard. I guess it doesn't really ferret out exactly where the PS5 Pro sits on the, you know, is it RDNA 3, is it RDNA 4, is it RDNA 2, where it exactly sits in that hierarchy. It's just saying that it's getting these features. Um, Another concern of mine is that the PS5 still doesn't have this functionality or has this functionality to a more compromised extent. So exactly what this means for cross-platform development, I'm not sure it means a great deal because you're still having to deal with that PS5 as your baseline system. You know, it's not an ideal situation where the largest selling console is still at a degraded level uh, of the feature set. Yeah, I think it would have been useful for basically the you know commonality in the feature set across all of the consoles just you know, to make sure that those good features are used. But I guess developers have managed to work their way around it in Alan Wake 2 and Avatar. So, well, I guess we just have to see what happens with the PS5 Pro and the extent to which these features are actually common, you know, used more commonly, because ultimately there is still going to be a huge amount of PlayStation 5s out there. It just kind of makes sense to target that feature set.